Well, good morning. My name is Matt Stone. I'm the lead pastor here at Mount Pisgah, and I'm honored to be in worship with you. I'm supposed to preach now, but I'm not sure after both a baptism and that song, I'm really not sure that a sermon's all that necessary. I, I think we've been to church already, uh, but it's, uh, yep, 9.55, so we've got 35 minutes left, so we may as well fill it with a sermon. Uh, particularly because I'm really excited to begin a new series today called The Other Side. It doesn't really matter what you're talking about. Crossing from one side to the other is a challenging kind of thing. It's a brutal kind of thing at times. Uh, think about Columbus, right? 61 days to travel 3,100 miles. Can you imagine the fear that it must have been, that they must have experienced to be just in the middle of the ocean, no idea what's happening, 61 days, 3,100 miles. What a difficult crossing from one side to the other. Think about Lewis and Clark who crossed the Continental Divide. Two years, for goodness sake, two years. 8,000 miles it took them to go from Louisiana to, I'm not sure what's north of Louisiana. I haven't looked very much lately, but they went a long way up there. Two years, 8,000 miles. Think about Neil and company, 238,900 miles from here to the moon and back. For goodness sake, sometimes crossing from one side to the other is brutal. The same thing's true of other kinds of crossings, right? As we prepare for November, I suspect all of us know intuitively and experientially that crossing the political divide is perhaps a thing of the past. Somebody, God bless them, I don't know who has time for this, somebody studied 1,700 hours of C-SPAN. Yikes. 1,700 hours of C-SPAN. And what they did was they tracked the number of times that a Republican crossed over to the Democratic side and a Democrat crossed over to the Republican side over a number of years and physically were crossing the aisle less. The physical reality reflects the ideological divide in our day and age. The same thing is true, by the way, of us in the church, the theological, crossing the theological divide, whether you're talking about sexuality or you're talking about Calvinism or whatever the divide is, crossing the theological divide may also be a thing of the past. Crossing from one side to the other is a brutal, brutal task. It might be easy to say, right, as, as, as geographical exploration fades away, as, as ideological crossing of divides seems to be becoming a thing of the past, it would be easy to say, what's the point? It'd be easy to wonder whether there's any reason why we ought to put the effort in. But what I want to suggest this week and over the next several weeks is that in this particular moment in our culture, in our nation's history, in our, in our church's history even, at this particular moment, there may not be a more important capacity to build. There may not be a more important mission to engage in than crossing from one side to the other. It's the kind of thing that will require us to chart new paths. It will require us the, uh, to have the courage to go. It will require of us to have the the perseverance through every obstacle. It will require of us the conviction that there might just be, there might just be something important, something of value over there that we can't get over here. So staying over here is not an option for us. We must, in fact, cross to the other side. It's a brutal kind of thing to do, especially in this day and age where we experience such polarization and division. And yet, this is exactly where, exactly where Jesus leads his disciples. There's a collection of stories in Mark's gospel that paints such a powerful picture of how and why Jesus crosses from one side to the other. It provides for us both the rationale and the roadmap for going from wherever it is that we are to wherever it is that they are. It reveals to us Jesus's courage, perseverance, and conviction. It's the kind of thing, these stories, when, they, when they're taken together, 
Uh, sometimes we divide stories and we only study one or, uh, or, or the other. But, but when we take these stories together that we're going to look at over the next three weeks, they challenge the way that we engage those on the other side who perhaps are in our own families. Maybe they're in our workplace. Perhaps they're in our neighborhood. They might be in our online communities. They could be just a part of our cultural reality. What we see when we take these stories together is a different way, a different path than the one our culture seems to be currently taking. So I'm excited to take you on the journey. And one more thing, these stories are bound together by their location. If you've been here for a little while, you know that this just sets my heart aflutter. Because what we're going to see is that the place that these stories unfold absolutely matters to what it means for us. So we have an incredible map. Let's put it up. I'm so excited about this map. Go ahead and put that map up. So this story begins, perhaps, there it is. This story begins where all stories do, in the beginning of Mark's gospel, where we already see this map moves where we already see in Mark chapter 1 that Jesus is moving where, from, where, from his hometown to what becomes his kind of headquarters and home base for much of his ministry on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. On the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, there's what's called the Evangelical Triangle, and it's composed of Capernaum, Chorazim, and Bethsaida. In that little triangle, one study suggests that up to 80% of Jesus' teaching, his ministry, his miracles— unfold right there on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee in that area, in that location. And it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense that Jesus would spend so much time right here because this is the right side of the tracks. That's where we're supposed to be if we are observant first century Jewish folks because that's the community that lives right there. These are people who carefully follow Jewish dietary laws. These are the people who carefully follow the commandments of the Lord in what we call the Old Testament. These are people who avoid ritual impurity. These are the kind of people who avoid anything that even smells a little bit like pagan idolatry. These are people, the folks who live in the evangelical triangle, these are people who are living for, who are looking for the Messiah to come. They are living and looking for the kingdom of God, of course This is where Jesus spends time. This is going to become his headquarters for his entire ministry. So we're not surprised to see in Mark chapter 3 and verse 7, what we hear is that Jesus is attracting to this very area. He's attracting not only people from all over that area, he's attracting people from all over Israel. Because of all all of Israel knows who lives on the northwest side of of the Sea of Galilee. These are folks who don't care about the power base, about the, uh, the authority, about the prestige of Jerusalem. That's not what they're interested in. What they're interested in is following God. What they are interested in and passionate about is living faithfully according to the life that God has set out for his people to live. So we shouldn't be surprised at all. Find at the beginning of Mark chapter 4, which if you have your Bible, we're going to spend the rest of today in Mark chapter 4, so I'd encourage you to go ahead and turn to it. We shouldn't be surprised at all to find at the beginning of Mark 4 that Jesus is once again by the lakeside, and he's gathered people first to teach. And he runs through a series of parables. What we hear is that the first parable is the parable uh, of, the, uh, of the, the scattering of the seeds. Right, that it's time, to, it's time to plant some seeds. And then we hear the parable of the lampstand, that, that this thing that we're doing is not meant to be hidden. I'll leave you to go back and read these parables. I hope, I hope you will at some point in the week because they are powerful parables. We just don't have time to go into them today. So it starts with the parable of the seeds where we're scattering seeds and this is, it's time to plant some seeds. What we're doing in the parable of the lampstand, what we're doing is not meant to be hidden. The next parable is the parable of the growing seed. That it is inevitable that when we plant seeds, when people see what we're up to, it's going to bear fruit. It is inevitable. The harvest is inevitable. And then uh, the last of this series of four parables is the parable of the mustard seed. What starts small is going to grow 
unimaginably large. It's time to plant some seed. What we're doing is not meant to be hidden. It's going to bear fruit, and it's going to start small before it grows big. And then at the end of Mark chapter 4, it's almost as though we we can almost feel a change happening. It's almost as though Jesus says, okay, enough teaching, enough talking. It's time to go do what I've taught you. It's time to begin the actual work. It's it's time to stop talking about what we should do. And it's time to go and do the work. This is in Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. It says, on that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go across to the other side. And we can immediately, if we were first century Jewish folks, we would immediately begin to feel uncomfortable. We're going to explore next week what exactly is on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But for right now, it's enough to know we don't want to go to the other side because we like this side. This is where the the observant Jewish folks are living. This is where God's people are living. Whatever it is on the other side, we don't want any part of it. As soon as Jesus tells the disciples, hey, let's get in the boat. We're going to go to the other side. As soon as he utters that sentence, we can feel the anxiety rising because we don't want any part of what's going on on the other side. And friends, you and I both know, we know that feeling. We don't want any part of those people. Whoever those people are in your life, it could be your next door neighbor who is insane. I don't want any part of those people. It could be your coworker who's a part of that political party, and we don't want any part of what they I know I should be careful. I know it. I know I said that political party. I didn't say which one it was. Whatever one it is for you, we don't want any part. We know that feeling. In this day and age, we live in that space all too often. And so what happens next is just poetic. Leaving the crowd behind, they took Jesus with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with them. I've never noticed that detail. Friends, I've been studying this collection of stories for years now. I've never noticed there were other boats. Jesus has a flotilla. He's got a whole navy traveling with him. It's not just him in one boat. It's a whole group of boats. I like this idea. He's taken the whole community with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. And I want to take a moment to explain, right? Sometimes we look at maps because they're interesting. Sometimes they change the interpretation, and sometimes we just like to be geeks. So I want you to hear how this windstorm arises. On the east side of the Sea of Galilee, over here, there's a high plateau. It's about 1,300 feet above the Sea of Galilee. And so what happens is that the air cools 1,300 feet above, and the air, while the air on the Sea of Galilee remains warm. And we all know from like second grade that hot air rises and cold air drops. So at an unpredictable time, that mass of cold air on the east side of the Sea of Galilee would rush down this steep cliff and interact with the warm air that's just sitting on the Sea of Galilee and create an unpredictable and violent storm. We're talking 40 to 60 mile an hour winds. We're talking six foot waves. And the boat that Jesus is in with his disciples is probably all of 12 feet. You can imagine the terror that must have arisen within the disciples and the frustration. Jesus, we told you not to go over here. I told you we didn't want any part of the other side. And now look what you've done. Look what you've done, Jesus. You have put us in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Oh, by the way, it's the dead of night. And these are fishermen who grew up on this sea. They know exactly. They could hear. I am, I, I'd be willing to bet my life on it. They could hear that storm coming before they felt it. They could hear that wind pick up. They could, they could feel the waves start to rise. And the world around them goes not only dark, but violent as well. What those disciples must have experienced, frankly, 
is what you and I experience, perhaps not physically, but at least emotionally and perhaps spiritually, a little too often. And it gets worse. Here's what happens in verse 38. The boat's already being swamped, but Jesus is in the stern, literally asleep at the wheel. Jesus is asleep at the rudder. And they woke him up and they said to him, teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? And that's the question. (laughs) That is the question that I think we love to ask. Because it arises out of desperation. Jesus, don't you, you let us out here. Don't you care that this is happening? You're asleep at the wheel. Are you serious? Don't you care about war, about political division? Don't you care about homelessness and food insecurity and racism and a mental health crisis? Don't you care about gun violence and all the rest? Don't you care? Isn't that the question? It sometimes sneaks in in those quiet moments, or perhaps at times is even deafening in moments of crisis. Isn't that the question that arises within our hearts as well? Not just the disciples on the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago, It's the followers of Jesus today, wondering perhaps, Jesus, are are you asleep at the wheel? Do Do you care what's happening to us? And they wake him up, and I want you to hear what he says. He woke up, and he rebukes the wind, and says to the sea, peace, be still. And this gets a little tricky for us, because as we read that, it might be tempting to read this as Jesus in a rather calm and meek way, saying, peace, be still. It's like he's leading yoga or something, right? That, it's kinda, we're we're kind of tempted to read Jesus in this way. He's just very calm and relaxed, and perhaps he'll put the storm to sleep, given enough time. But those aren't the words that Jesus utters. When Jesus says, peace, what he's saying is, stop. That word is not an invitation. It is a command. It is an an unrefutable command. Stop what you're doing. When he says, be still, it carries the, the connotation of muzzling, right? He takes the bite out of the storm. He rebukes the wind commands it to stop, and then takes the bite out of it. And it says that the winds and the storm immediately ceased. Who but God, who but God has that power? This story isn't a neat trick that Jesus accomplishes to save himself and his friends. This story is a revelation of Jesus's own identity, that he is God on earth. And his response to the disciples' question, our our question too, his response to, to, to this question, don't you care that we're dying, God? His response is, of course I care. That's why I'm with you in the boat. That's why the outcome was never in doubt. Because I am with you. And I have both the power and the authority and the compassion to travel alongside and to calm the storm. Of course I care. Of course I'm going with you. Nothing could keep me from getting to the other side. Nothing can keep me from from going, from attaining that which Jesus desired. Notice that Jesus wants to go from here to here, and that storm is blowing in the exact opposite direction. Right? There is some force at work attempting to muzzle Jesus, 
There is some force at work attempting to bind Jesus. There is some force at work attempting to say, Jesus and your followers, stay in your lane. You don't belong over here. There is some force at work that has no chance. No chance against the creator of the heavens and the earth. There's some force at work that doesn't have the power that Christ has. Friends, ours isn't to calm the storm. Ours is simply to get in the boat. To get in the boat and trust that if that's where Jesus is going, to the other side, then I need to be with him. Ours is to just get in the boat. But when we get in the boat on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, don't expect it to stay tied up at the dock. It's going somewhere different. Because there is something over there of importance. There is something over there of value. Whatever the other side is in your mind, Jesus wants it. Whoever is on the other side, Jesus wants them. And he's sending us. He says, it's good, right, and holy for you to stay on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee to learn and to grow, to experience the, the blessings of life with Christ. But friends, it's time to stop talking about it. It's time to get in the boat, and it's time to go to the other side. Next week, we'll find out what's there when we get there. And it's not easy, but it is of value. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks this morning. We're grateful for your son who teaches us so much about how you work in this world. We're grateful for your son who who teaches us and, and challenges us to plant the seed of your gospel in the world around us, to do it in a way that is visible to the world around us and to expect a harvest to come, a harvest that begins small and grows beyond imagination. And so as we receive that teaching, Lord, I pray for the courage, the perseverance, and the conviction, God, to get in the boat. Because we know, oh God, that when we travel with you, when we go with you, no storm will swamp it. No power can defeat it. And that the journey with you is worth it. Because whatever you're doing, God, we want to be a part of. We pray all this in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen.